happy to be here today. Uh, I work in tech and I spend a lot of time these days thinking about how the fast progress within tech is changing the fundamental conditions for humanity. And I would like to talk to you about tech, about standing on the shoulders of giants, and about injecting a purpose into the next generation. I believe we are at the verge of a technological explosion. It's estimated that humanity has created more data in the last two years than all of human history altogether. We have exponential growth in computing power. But I have a personal example of what's happening. This is me as a kid. If we were lucky, we were able to find prank cones and could play with them. It might not be entirely true, but among the raddest things you could do within technology as a 15-year-old boy, you could remove the inlet plug of your moped and try to make the engine go as fast as possible. Of course I did that. <laughs> 27 years later, this is my older son Anton with his Arduino. And the Arduino is a small open source computer which you can use to make electronics experiments projects. And what I've noticed with Anton is he has always a lot of, he always sees opportunities and has a lot of projects he wants to do from setting up helium balloons with phones, taking pictures of the earth to making liquid engine, rocket engines. I don't know where he gets all his ideas from, but a couple of months ago, he had the idea to create a robotic hand and control the robotic hand with his own hand. And when I was on a business trip a few months back, he sent me this prototype video, which he built with his Arduino and the servo. And when he did some research, he found out that he could actually download and 3D print an entire robotic hand. And 3D printing is pretty awesome, don't you think? And together with a hand scanner, hand camera I had at work, he was able to put together this. So this is the robotic hand that he can control with his own hand. The little black thing is the camera that make, sees how he's moving his hands and he's able to control the hand. And this is really about being able to stand on the shoulders of giants, being able to use what has already been invented and created. And I think it's quite astonishing that something that was kind of science fiction a few years back is something that a techie teenager can put together today. And I can't even imagine the opportunities my grandchildren will have. And looking at examples, other examples, you can go to the automotive industry. They have stopped talking about autonomous cars. They take all well, take this for granted, even though it's not publicly available. They are looking at the next step, and that's transforming cars as we know them into transportation as a service. And this will probably benefit humanity quite a lot. We will be able to utilize vehicles in much more. They're trying to achieve what the music streaming industry did to the CD, transforming something that we buy and own into actually having access to music. And we will probably see fewer vehicles, and if the traffic increases, like Elon Musk thinks it might, then his boring company might sold out as well. And we'll have less accidents. We can use, probably utilize space that is currently reserved for parking. But the thing I think is most interesting in right now is what's happening within machine learning and artificial intelligence. So what has happened since the chess computer DPU <coughs> was able to beat Gary Kasparov in 97? In 2011, Watson beat the reigning Jeopardy champions. And last year, AlphaGo was able to beat the Go champion. And that's a, quite an achievement given that Go is so much more complex than chess, 
and it's said to require intuition in order to excel at it. And these days, computers, machines are as good as humans, sometimes even better, in areas where the humans really used to excel in. This is, example is from a computer that performed on par with trained physicians in diagnosing skin cancer. And just think about the possibilities when we have this kind of technology on our smartphones. We could revolutionize healthcare. This is a example from work where we try to use new technology, put them together into to create new services. And here we have used uh, facial recognition and the uh, now we can use out-of-the-box understanding of uh, spoken language in order to create new services. And we do something like this. Hello, David Tran. How can I help you today? I'm here for a meeting. Who are you here to meet? Johnny. Do you mean Johnny Dan? Yes. All right. I will notify Johnny Dan that you are here. Take a seat and have a wonderful day. So behind the mirror, there's a screen showing information. On top, there's a camera, which is used for facial recognition. So it actually recognizes David, and it actually sends a text message to Johnny, saying you have a visitor. Just think about the implications this has will have to the uh, receptionist profession, for example. And going forward, I believe that we will benefit quite a lot from machine learning and artificial intelligence. This is from the movie Her by Spike Jones. Hands up who's seen it? Uh, quite a few. Uh, it's about the uh, main character falling in love with his AI. And when I saw it, I thought it was quite far-fetched. But having had Google Home and Amazon Alexa at home for quite some time, I'm not in love with them. Uh, but I do th think we could create emotional bonds with machines in the, in the near future, given that they act more and more human-like. But I think personal AIs, will we will really benefit from them, enabling us to skip the boring things and let the personal assistants keep, take care of them and focus on the, doing the things that we really love. Why is all of this happening right now? Well, there's many reasons for it. I think one of the biggest reasons is that we are actually able to stand on the shoulders of giants. If we go back to the ride-hailing service that I mentioned at the beginning, you need a lot of things in place to do that. For one example is the high-precision positioning service, which we all take to, for granted today, the GPS. But if we dissect this a little bit and look what is needed in order to have a GPS service, we would have to have invented navigation, which was done some time ago, of course, uh, sending things to space, satellites, atomic clocks, etc., etc. And that's just for that tiny service that we take for granted. And for autonomous cars, we need machine learning, artificial intelligence, computer vision, robotics, and a lot of other stuff that is available to us right now. And with all of these possibilities that we've had within tech, we do have a great responsibility to do good. And I, I think my generation has a great responsibility, but we are kind of a generation of conformists. We have been taught to study hard, get a job, tend for the family, go on vacation, buy a car, and not care too much about the bigger picture. So I think we need a little bit more radical change than we're seeing in my generation. So I think it's our, my generation's foremost responsibility to give the desire and the tools to the next generation to really make a difference. And when it comes to tech and opportunities, there are of course risks with this as well. One obvious thing that's come out of technology that hasn't really served humanity is the atomic bomb more recent examples you might find with the Tay bot. Uh, Tay was an experiment on using machine learning artificial intelligence to train a bot 
how to interact with humans. And it took only 24 hours to create a really rude and racist bot. And you could argue from a technological standpoint that this was good, but it was certainly not, nothing that they tried to achieve. And they was turned off after 24 hours. Uh, I believe that machine learning and artificial intelligence will benefit humanity, but we really need to take care about what risks, what are the risks and how do we handle them. And there are people way smarter than I am who really think that machine super intelligence might pose a uh, threat to humanity. And we're in the fourth industrial revolution and we have a two-fold problem. A lot of research saying that up to 50% of jobs will be redundant within the next 20 years. And the other part of that is also that we will be lacking competence in order to really take advantage of how to take, take advantage of the opportunities and how to avoid the risks with technology, technology going so fast. And governments have seen this. And in Sweden, we will have programming from first grade soon. But the aim might be a little bit off. Programming is good. But we really need to focus on the opportunities and the risks with new technology. And maybe focus more on creative thinking than just programming. The school system moves slowly and technology moves very fast. In craft today, people are still knitting Ludwiga gloves and carving out butter knives when they should maybe be focusing on digital creation, 3D modeling, 3D printing, and putting up, creating new things using new technology. So how do we bridge this gap? I don't think we can leave it to the schools. Um, there are examples in a society where things are happening. One is the Kodo Dojo movement, where volunteers from the tech industry help youngsters to understand digital, the digital possibilities and teach them how to program and code new services. Another example is the maker movement, which is quite hyped these days, where people get together to build new things, new cool stuff, using new technology. So I would like to end with saying, we can't leave it to the school system to, to prepare the next generation. It's up to all of us. So let us all help the next generation to find a purpose and prepare them for the opportunities and challenges of their time. Thank you.